My subject tonight is specifically literary computing. I was trained as a literary critic by Northrop Frye in Toronto and have never forgotten that. I was like others who studied with Frye, what people in Toronto call deep fried. <laughs> but it's taken me quite a while to get back to literary studies and to ask the question why computing has really not done anything substantial or essential for literary studies other than provide texts online. This has been a constant refrain for the last many, many years, as I will detail and I'll give you in some detail. And a lot of uh, complaints and reasons given, but none of them to me satisfactory. Ultimately, the question is, if it hasn't done anything for, for li literary stu studies, either people like me should give up, or we should figure out why and what might be done about it. Let me give you a taste of the difficulty. I mean, we all read, right? Um, so this is not unfamiliar territory, but it, we need a bit of reminder, I think. This is from David Grossman's novella, Frenzy, which I picked up this afternoon when looking around in a Dublin bookshop. She envelops his entirety with her gaze from the soles of his large and venerable looking feet with toes splayed out to his luminous face and smiles as she whispers again, here I am. The man does not think there is anything superfluous in her utterance. On the contrary, he expands his chest to take in everything contained in those three words, here I am. Here is all of me for you. Here I am as I truly am. Here I am, unpeel me. His face says yes, his body says yes, and his heart and eyes and breath and everything says yes. And for the thousandth time he marvels at how even when she says something simple and obvious, as she often does, it is always followed by an echo of wonder. And my question to you is, what can computing tell you about that? And how can we figure out how to say something about that? If you know your Joyce, you will hear echoes of some sort or other of the last page of Ulysses, of Molly Bloom saying yes. And that's the beginning of a long thread that I want to try to untangle. I'm going to show you some slides, some of which are just to uh, stimulate thought. But there will be a table of contents which recurs throughout to give you reassurance that this talk will end. Because no matter how interesting a talk is, you always want to know that it is going to end. So, 65 years ago, on successive Friday evenings in the Physical Laboratory Lecture Theater, Trinity College, Dublin, physicist Erwin Schrödinger gave a three-part lecture on the curious failure of the physical sciences to answer the question, what is life? and the promise of a new physics to address that failure. Schrodinger was an intellectually brave man who saw no other escape from the dilemma in which ignorance of the whole increasingly places the specialist than that, quote, some of us should venture to embark on a synthesis of facts and theories, albeit with secondhand and incomplete knowledge of some of them, and at the risk of making fools of ourselves. Now, a lifetime later, with the infirmity of literary computing rather than the impotence of physics in mind, I cannot think of a better way of putting before you the challenge we students of literature face from computing, nor can I think of a better response. To put the situation in a nutshell, by placing the question of method in the path of scholarship, computing offers us the chance to be similarly brave. I will return near the end of my lecture to a much greater intimacy in the parallel between us and Schrodinger. But for now, let me just state the problem as I see it, which turns out to be not entirely dissimilar to his. Why computing has been unable to do much for the interpretive operations that are central to the humanities and of all consuming interest to scholars of literature and the arts. See, there's my table of contents. The relationship between computing and literary studies has had a problematic history. 
In 1966, when the first professional journal in the field, Computers in the Humanities, began, groundbreaking activity, which had begun some 20 years earlier, became suddenly visible across all the disciplines. Early dramatic success in computing had stirred popular and scholarly interest in what computers were doing and might be able to do. In 1957, Herbert Simon had made startling predictions for the subsequent decade. Up there, highlighted, put it bluntly, how not, uh, hard now to shock, he wrote in his lecture notes, machines think, learn, create. In a similar vein, British computational linguist Margaret Masterman asserted in her contribution to freeing the mind a series published in the Times Literary Supplement in 1962 that the computer was far more than the menial tool other contributors had described. It was, she declared, a telescope of the mind, which like its astronomical namesake would soon enlarge the whole range of what its possessors could see and do and so change their whole picture of the world. Words quoted approvingly four years later in a book on the automated analysis of text. At the end of that decade, the editor of The Economist predicted that in the 1970s, the computer would come into its own, perhaps even challenging the outlook of man. A somewhat less restrained Canadian journalist had proclaimed five years earlier a new age of miracles in terms strikingly similar to a 21st century funding concept known as the semantic web. Battle lines were being drawn over the significance of computing. Note, however, not the expected one with enthusiastic promoters on one side and grumpy Luddites on the other, but the one between those like Masterman who focused on the augmentation of human capacities and those like Simon whose interests in automation led straight back to Frederick Winslow Taylor's clerkish elevation of efficiency, the modern factory production line, a leisure class of passive consumers, and all the rest of modernism's children. Two assessments from the mid-1960s told a sobering story, however. In alchemy and artificial intelligence, with the clock still ticking on Simon's confident predictions, Hubert Dreyfus, diagnosed stagnation in AI research, pointing to unexpected difficulties which had followed the early successes. What had been assumed to be a difference of degree between current and envisioned systems had turned out to be a difference in kind with no known way across the discontinuities. The following year, the devastating black book on machine translation, Language and Machines, Computers in Translation and Linguistics, came to more or less the same conclusion. As computational linguist Yorick Wilkes noted a few years later, it had been clear for some time that the era of simple-minded machine translation was over and that a new, very different research paradigm was needed. In the 1960s, among the beleaguered minority of literary scholars who dared to compute, and if you were a postgraduate student, you were taking your life into your hands if you admitted it, the prevalent view of computing was, as it has remained, clerkish, Taylorian, an invaluable assistant to scholarship, as Susan Hockey has said, most usefully deployed to probe for textual surface features, and so to prompt the inquirer to reflect on the methodology used to interpret the results. In other words, it made scholarship more efficient, progress a matter of traversing what in 1965 poet and English professor Ephraim Fogel called the vision actuality interval, which however wearisome was, he thought, only an incremental matter of time, fortitude, and steadily accumulating resources. Enough of these resources were in fact already to hand when he wrote those words. As with AI and machine translation, progress faltered because the problem was theoretical, not practical. A different, non-incremental idea of computing was required. A year later, in the first article of the first issue of Computers and the Humanities, Louis Millich turned attention back to the ideals of scholarship. 
He argued that literary scholars, lest we forget, who are involved primarily with the mystery of the creative act, needed to reorganize their thinking for the new age by turning from the computer as plodding mechanical clerk to the possibilities of a creative instrument. He was not the only one saying such things. Perhaps the clearest statement came in 1978 when Susan Wittig, a professor of English in Texas, referring to Masterman's vision, pointed out that computing had undoubtedly allowed for improvements, making performance of old tasks more efficient and accurate, but had not delivered on the promise. She argued that inattention to theory had made literary computing vulnerable to covert influence by a positivistic concept of text derived ultimately from new criticism. A computing without theory, Colin Martindale argued the same year, was no better than method in search of a paradigm to direct and explain it. Richard Bailey, quoting Wittig and Martindale, declared that practitioners were blindly groping their way through criticism's past with a time lag of about 50 years. As early as the beginning of Humanities Computing's first professional journal, the whistle was thus blown on naive literary computing. But as with AI, imaginative scholars had opened the door, a door that they could not close, to a problem that challenged the theoretical ground of its practice. The fact that this hugely difficult challenge was largely ignored in the humanities, given the relative ease of devising technical solutions to simple problems, can hardly be surprising. We're all, after all, quite lazy. But ignoring it has meant that however excellent in kind, however supportive of interpretation, literary computing has tended silently to perpetuate the concept of text to which the whistleblowers objected. Despite the intention declared two years ago at the Summit on Digital Tools in the Humanities in Virginia to enable new and innovative approaches to humanistic scholarship, discussions of tool building have likewise been preoccupied with features of software, ignoring the discourse of criticism as it has moved on. Despite the ambitious aims of the Chicago Digital Humanities Computer Science Colloquium, now in its third year, we find no sign that this challenge is recognized, although it is fundamental to the important question the colloquium raises. No surprise, then, that a decade after Wittig, in the year that the text analysis program TACT was released to the public, Roseanne Potter remarked that literary computing had not been rejected, but rather neglected by mainstream criticism, a complaint repeated many times since. Numerous reasons for this neglect have been offered, but the fact remains that literary computing has had very little to say in response to critical discourse for the last half century. In the preface, a preface to Radiant Textuality, Jerome McGann noted its instrumental role in the technical and pre-critical occupations on which scholarship depends, but its almost total absence from interpretative procedures. It would be a mistake, however, to say that the fault lies solely with literary computing's neglect of theory. For the past several decades, most theorizing shading into what Jonathan Culler has called just plain theory, has offered few points of contact with the study of actual texts, and so few possibilities for coaxing computing practitioners out of their theoretical silence. In addition, the social division in universities that has separated the non-technically educated theorists and critics from the less institutionally privileged technical experts has impeded, and in some countries continues greatly to impede, read for that the United States, progress. Something has to be done, but what? In the article I have already cited, Martindale pointed out that both literary theory and literary computing have strengths and weaknesses. But the striking thing is that the strengths of one are the weaknesses of the other. If the two were meshed, he suggested, the weaknesses would largely be canceled out. But rather than mesh, Empirical and theoretical approaches have been taken up each in turn, each taken as the answer rather than as the answer's other half. Leonard Forster noted in his presidential address to the Modern Humanities Association, also in 1978, a curiously productive year, 
That as a result, we get dogmatic abstractions, the criticisms formed around them becoming what he called a flight from literature. It's a marvelous article, I suggest you read it. He recommended a flexible pragmatism analogous to the craftsman's who selects now this tool, now that one to accomplish whatever task is at hand. Forster's metaphor is a good one, not because it privileges the scholarly task over the tool, which is the timid mantra of service-orientated computing, but because it places tools in the context of an active interface between craftsman and material. So, the moral of the story is that neither task nor tool holds the secret. What's needed is attention to the craftsmanship, to the process and practice of that which criticism entails. Literary computing can doubtless continue as the invaluable assistant to scholarship, following criticism wherever it goes and trying its best to be of service. But scattered results from literary computing, obviously better theory, and the benefits of hooking up with the discourse of criticism suggests that Martindale's Leibnizian marriage of theorist and empiric is not only possible, but holds great promise. The fact that literary computing remains vigorous, however ghettoized by specialist concerns into specialist periodicals, suggests an underdeveloped rather than a moribund research program. The question is, again, what now must be done? In the book I published in 2005, Humanities Computing, I took up part of this task by concentrating on the theoretical implications of computing as an analytical approach to the study of the humanities as a whole. I presented a negative epistemology, arguing that the primary function of computing is not to automate knowing, but to identify what we somehow know but cannot adequately specify. Because computing gives us manipulatory power over the models we construct, we are able rapidly to close in on that which cannot be formulated. Thus we are confronted, as Collingwood said, with our own quite specific ignorance of cultural artifacts and so are better equipped to question them. For literary studies, this epistemology takes computing significantly beyond the standard view of an efficient, but essentially mute and obedient handmaiden. By challenging us in detail to account for the failure of any rigorously analytical try for a systematic order of things. But, this is my repudiation of my book, which is necessary for maintaining sanity. But it takes us no further than the negative gift with positive consequences that lie somehow beyond what any such try can in principle do. The situation in which we find ourselves suggests an analogy to the observational sciences. As Ian Hacking has argued for microscopy, the fundamental problem raised by all observational instruments, including the telescope to which Masterman appeals, is that we don't just peer through them to newly visible objects that are as we see them to be independently of the viewing. We must also interfere with the incoming data based on what we know of what we are trying to observe. We must make sense with these data, sometimes by intervening in the observational process, sometimes by altering the object of study. This we simply cannot do, or at least not do well, without a good idea of what we are looking at. In literary studies, such knowing interference is not, as in the sciences, so much a preliminary step toward consensus about the object in view as it is an ongoing, never-ending process. The literary object in view is hardly an object at all, but the contingent, interactive, emergent outcome we wisely use a gerund to name, reading. For centuries, of course, the Codex book has functioned as such an observational instrument. I.A. Richards named it a machine to think with in 1926, encouraging interpretive interference with the flow of language, even as in critical editions and commentaries, providing observational sequences of interfering moves. This is the book not only as meta-theoretical statement, as Jerry McGann says, but as analog to firmware. Computing foregrounds book as machine especially in the design and construction of digital reference works. But computing is also significantly a gerund, not a name for an action or a set of actions, but a name for acting. 
It is, I argued in Humanities Computing, fundamentally a modeling machine. Hence, its introduction into literary studies implicitly shifts emphasis from representation to intervening, and so implies that theorizing of text at the fundamental level of tool design and use is essential. And that's what we've been ignoring. If this is so, as I think it is, then much more than the epistemological question is at stake. To be brought to ask how we know what we somehow know but cannot represent computationally is a major step forward. But it is preliminary to asking the ontological question Wittig raised in 1978 and McGann again in 2004. What is text that it eludes all such representation? That it can be, in Jerry's wonderful words, the hem of a quantum garment. Analytical literary computing tells us how to exploit the unavoidable difference between textual representation and reality, but it has nothing at all to say about what we choose to represent. Even if we agree, as we certainly should not, to limit the textual object of study to its verbal data, trouble starts with the context required for interpretation. The dominant consensus within a critical specialism may obscure the problem and often does, but we are warned of it by the crippling difficulties of infinite regress that the very idea of context appears to cause whenever anyone asks what exactly it is a promissory note for. Context, Jonathan Culler remarked, is merely more text, and so appeal to it solves nothing. But appealing to it, particularly if it is to be modeled computationally across the open domain of literature or of conversation in real life, reveals how unsatisfactorily arbitrary and limiting the unspoken notion or any analytic formulation of it is. The problem of context is the problem of text. So what is it? By failing to ask this question, which I call the wittig mcgann question, literary computing is confined to providing evidence for or against what we already know or suspect. It is strongly inhibited in its capacity to surprise. Providing evidence seems justification enough, but evidence, please note, becomes increasingly problematic as the volume of data exceeds the norm for critical practices formed prior to the exponential growth of online resources. This is the light at the end of the tunnel, which turns out to be a, a train coming in the opposite direction. As this volume increases, so does the probability of arbitrary choice, and so the ease with which any statement may be connected to any other statement. Good critics may do better scholarship as a result of finding what they, more of what they need. Bad critics may be swiftly becoming worse ones more easily. The point, however, is that literary computing has thereby served only as mutely obedient handmaiden, and so done nothing much to rescue itself from its position of weakness, from which it can hardly deliver the benefits claimed for it by the faithful. It has done little to educate scholars methodologically. There is, of course, no a single answer to the wittig mcgann question because there are many kinds of text, many ideas of what to do with each kind, and every reason to think that these kinds and ideas are limited only by human ingenuity. Given the renewed prominence that McGann's work has brought to the question, what can be done is to develop ways of asking it, such as that responses can be made in software. An obvious starting point is with inherited tools of reference, for example, lexicons, critical editions, and commentaries, inferring from them the ideas of text they implement. To the degree this has been done, in aid of speculating about or designing a software equivalent, results suggest the prominent role of tacit uses in the social context of argument and in the building of a pro of a, or maintaining of a social imaginary. I'll return to the importance of this a bit later. Results also illumine the primitive crudity of our software tools. Let's take a brief look at them to see what they can teach us. We know from the unsatisfactory experience that none of these tools do very well with the wittig mcgann question, but to do anything useful at all, they have to have a view of text that can be recovered. 
Well, when we look at these tools, the answers we get back additionally are rather impoverished. A concordancer, for example, implies that by text, we mean a corpus informed by verbal correspondence of passages and by the words that collocate with whatever word is in focus. Both relational database design and formal ontologies imply an instantiated set of concepts and their interrelations, and prior to these, well-defined perspectives of inquiry. An annotation tool affords a view of text as the occasion for commentary. A statistical analyzer yields a complex population of verbal clues to a literary style. Now these are valid, even highly valuable aspects of text, but again, they are isolated and so isolating and they can't even begin to approach the Grossman problem that I began with. We can, however, greatly enrich what each has to contribute by considering their historical origins. The most obvious to be explored is concordancing, a direct descendant of the late 12th or early 13th century device invented to serve figural interpretation of the Bible, which once it achieved formal stability in the late 13th century, remained broadly the same until computing. There is, by the way, a marvelous example of a medieval concordance in, in the uh, library at Trinity that I was looking at this afternoon. The keyword and context format devised in the 1950s to satisfy the needs and cap capabilities of automation shifted focus from the concordant passages of a text to shared collocates of a word and so moved the principal domain of use from literary studies to corpus linguistics. Nevertheless, the mechanized idea of semantic triangulation basic to the figural scheme remains implicit in the tool which that scheme articulates and so in the results the tool produces. It bears with it, or more accurately implies, a theory and compositional principle derived from the most influential text in the European tradition, namely the Bible. So also the tools and techniques of annotation imply a partial answer to the Vidig McGann question. These have historical roots in ancient commentary practice, including manuscript glosses, marginalia, freestanding notes, and other forms of intertextuality, together with their social networks. Relational database design and textual ontologies are similarly emergent from older practices of categorization and tabular layout, beginning with ancient libraries, and more recently from the strong cultural predisposition toward discontinuous plurality. Lev Minovich's argument for the database as symbolic form provides a starting point here. These are all very rich book-length projects waiting to be done. If you know any eager medievalists who need a book subject to write, they can pick one of these. Writing a conceptual history of literary computing from its tools helps to give it a theoretical voice but at best, the exercise yields a semi-coherent miscellany with uncertain relationship to actual research. The result is even worse than expected because the ideas of text we seek are partially in the tools, partially in unexpected uses of them, especially if true of those tools not designed for the purpose, which means most of the tools we use, and in the usual situation where more than one tool is used, partly, uh, partially which tools are applied in what sequence. Lacking in a tradition of experimental work as we are, undereducated technologically, and so undervaluing or simply not seeing the mediation tools perform, researchers have tended to omit the kind of observations we need. Unsurprisingly, evidence from the scholarly record in the rare instances in which it exists at all is scattered through footnotes and asides in publications across many disciplines in many languages. In any case, I'm getting increasingly hopeless. In any case, there is no hole for these parts to sum to, no great idea of text that may be assembled from the scattered fragments of implementation. But the point of asking the Vidig McGann question is quite otherwise. To enable literary computing to make a great inductive leap from its mute servant's mimetic doldrums to an understanding of itself as a full participant in the interpretative operations of criticism. To devise new tools without the benefit of that question has not and will not significantly increase the mildly helpful 
but severely cobbled abilities of literary computing, no matter how much data accumulates. In fact, as I suggested, the accumulation of more data only makes the problems worse. McGann's own response to the question has been to argue for the reversal of perspective within criticism already implied by the Bakhtinian situating of text in an immense, boundless world of others' words. The details of this response, including the online game Ivanhoe, are best presented by his own writings, which are taken here as required reading and a point of departure to which I will return. But that reversal of perspective is already inescapable given the problem of context, which itself seems inevitable once we free literary computing from the strictures of a knowledge jukebox to become a project for modeling literature. The fundamental role of modeling is itself an inevitable consequence of Mr. Turing's universal machine. The term modeling, which I've used a lot, is so polysemous that its meaning cannot take and be, be taken for granted, so I had better say what I mean by it. Here I show the modeling relation between a formal or abstract system, such as a computer program, and a natural system or artifact, such as a poem. In humanities computing, I argued for the analytical, analytical mimetic kind that Clifford Geertz has called modeling of, which aims at refinement of the epistemological question, as I noted earlier. Geertz distinguished this kind from its opposite, modeling for, a more or less creative realization of an idea or design achieved through perfective, exploratory manipulation. Standard example of modeling for is creating a new airplane wing, for example. The Bakhtinian reversal, however, entails a different sort of modeling from either of those two, something that resembles modeling for but begins without a pre-existing design, or at least not a consciously accessible one. It is a mapless modeling forward towards something that is not yet anything. Using the musicological term, I call it improvisational modeling <coughs> to denote its moment by moment development in performance of an emergent potential. This sort of modeling is widely attested in the experimental sciences. What it might be for text, reflects again the Vidig McGann question. It is a truism that asking questions is central to the humanities and that good research leads from a worthy question to better ones. The Vidig McGann question is certainly worthy, but it leaves us with the problem of how to reformulate it so that it may be asked in software. Before we can even get properly started, that is, we must confront the gulf separating the language of criticism from the language of implementation. Happily, this gulf is bridgeable. In fact, collaborative projects in the digital humanities have for years negotiated it as a matter of course by developing common ways of talking about problems and objects that have different meanings for the various participants. But although collaboration offers great benefit of other-mindedness, Alone, it is an inefficient and only partially effective means of furthering research that is fundamentally the result of two or more intersecting, interacting practices. Collaboration, whenever possible, needs to be internalized so that this interacting can occur at the speed of thought and not just at the pace of meetings. Hence the need for a bridging discourse. The time-honored approach for building a new discourse is to reach into another discipline, an older established practice, and take what you need. It's often called borrowing, but it's really stealing. And then adapt to what you've found. In each case, what, this, what happens when you do that is you connect uh, uh, the poorly understood phenomenon or system with a, better, with a better understood one, the one you're borrowing from. This analogy links relationships. This is my favorite photograph of all. As A is to B within one system, <coughs> so C is to D in another. Its strongest claim is that the two systems, however different they are, as those two are, are isotropic, i.e. the same governing laws or principles apply in both. 
And that's a breathtaking assumption. Our whole existence is based on it, but it's still breathtaking. Hence, a strong analogy not only holds up to examination and yields many insights, it also pulls the connected fields closer together by emphasizing similar processes in both. Each analogical connection must be probed for its actual benefits as well as its cognitive trajectory, but because its yield may not be known for some time, for example in that case, the best anyone may be able to hope for is plausibility at the outset. Analogizing is conjectural. Considerable effort is required to maintain an analogy as conjectural and not to blur it into an identity as we tend to do, especially when it appears greatly to simplify an intractable problem. In other words, analogizing, borrowing, stealing ideas from elsewhere is as perilous as it is powerful. In the present case, what we're looking for is in the words of a London improvisational musician, how one gets from A to C when there is no B. If that is, we begin as readers do, with a text, and so the question of how reading may be modeled, we need to bridge the gulf between Bakhtinian language and a design strategy for a computing system capable of implementing its outward-looking improvisational trajectory. One promising place to begin is with, improvis is with evolutionary biology, whose fundamental problem is precisely to answer the improvisational question for living systems. And so we return to Erwin Schrodinger's lecture at Trinity in 1943 for the more intimate parallel I promised. In his commentary on Schrodinger's project, theoretical biologist Robert Rosen has argued that by asking his question, illegitimate, some say, within the confines of ordinary science, Schrodinger diagnosed the fatally constricting path of reductionist methods that had had such great influence on 20th century thought. Our universes of scientific discourse are limited, Rosen declared, not by the demands of problems that need to be solved, but by extraneous standards of rigor. The result is a mindset of reductionism, of looking only downward toward subsystems and never upward and outward. What he does not say, but needs here to be said, is that the influence of scientific discourse on all others has been so great that this mindset of reductionism is our mindset as well. So also analogically is the alternative Rosen presents, a turn toward the quasi-teleological but non-deterministic idea of self-organizing systems, hence the ideas of complexity, emergence, and autopoiesis, of which McGann makes extensive use, coming primarily from the culturally ascendant biological scientists including biological anthropology. The moral of the story is make friends with a biologist. Biology and its nearest neighbors, which after all still lie at a formidable conceptual distance from criticism, are not the only fields concerned with how more sophisticated systems arise from less sophisticated ones, however. Other likely candidates which I'm looking into include anthropological linguistics and conversation analysis, improvisational musicology, including but not limited to studies of jazz, and the cognitive sciences where, for example, the psychology of reading meets its neurological correlates. These are all promising sources of analogies. Perhaps now it's worthwhile returning to Margaret Masterman's Telescope of the Mind in 1962 to ask what sort of computational instrument might live up to the promise of enlarging the whole range of what we might see and do as critics, and so change our whole picture of literature. The most imaginatively powerful attempt to date is Jerry McGann's Ivanhoe, an online play space in which participants intervene, change, add to, and comment on the discourse field of a given cultural artifact, such as uh, Scott's Ivanhoe. <coughs> the critical objective of the players of Ivanhoe is to explore in blog-like exchanges the possible worlds or imaginative trajectories of this artifact from an authorial inner standing point. Computational tools aid the interpretative, interpretative play by managing communications between the players 
and by visualizing, these, visualizing the interactions so as to stimulate the player's imaginations. Scope of play is constrained to the focal artifact, which players are assumed to know. Googling for whatever is permitted, anything else is permitted during the game, but the game does not aid or direct the search. That is the, the game's devices, the, the computer. Ivanhoe is thus more closely analogous to a microscope than a telescope, but it is a masterman's kind of microscope, nevertheless, because it is built explicitly and self-consciously for looking outward from the artifact toward its manifold possibilities. In the rationale for Ivanhoe, McGann borrows extensively from theoretical biology and elsewhere, as I have suggested, we need to do, but the analogies are, in his case, rhetorical rather than computational. My research question is this, can we do more? Can we use these analogies to design modeling machines capable of finding connections from a given literary text to others? Or can we adapt whatever software may exist, for example, to simulate evolutionary or improvisational development? In 1989, Northrop Frye mentioned in passing, after saying that he knew nothing about computing at all and really wasn't qualified to speak on this subject, mentioned the possibility that modeling such as I have described might be used to converge on fundamental structures of literature through systematic investigation of its recurring conventional units. And that's become my research project. Is this a realizable goal, however? It's clear from what I have said that although such modeling machines must be able to search all text in digital form, mere searching is not only insufficient but perilous without some kind of automated guidance. It's clear from the massiveness of the collection to be searched that only the most rudimentary scholarly metadata, if any at all, can be expected, though metadata generated by search engines could perhaps be exploited to advantage. It's clear that whatever the instrument does, it must be far more of a cognitively intimate companion than a bot, however semantic the web that gets searched. Searching will need to start from a reading, somehow specified of a given text, produce results from the textual collection, and learn from the reader's response, modifying both future and existing results according to what it learns. Hence, because the envisioned operations are massively combinatorial, they may well require more computing power than is easily available, at least now. They may be supercomputerish. Finally, it's evident that tools of some kind, perhaps like Ivanhoe, offering visual representations, will be needed so that the investigator can direct the machine more effectively and imagine more generously than otherwise. So, the question of how to build such a thing is, in essence, the question of where the permeable moving membrane is between reader and device, or to put the matter differently, how great a role computing can play in criticism. This is, in effect, the question of artificial intelligence, and so presumably a matter of keen interest for AI researchers. Mm.